we're not even going to bother signing artists anymore. But you can hire our PR and marketing department, tell us what kind of budget you've got, and we'll put together something that suits your budget. You can hire our accounts department to manage your royalties. You can hire maybe our um, uh, A&R department to help you decide on what's going to go on your record. Label services. They're effectively outsourcing the departments that they've already got. I think that's quite a good idea. And I think that will be a useful thing for artists to have. You need to arrive at a certain level before you can really say, OK, I'm going to spend five grand or ten grand or twenty grand on hiring Warners to put together some kind of marketing campaign for me. But that's not a bad idea. Anybody attracted to this? Yes. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That's not a bad idea. Are they, are they all doing it? I don't know if they're all doing it. It's an increasingly common thing. And one thing that, that has happened a lot is that people who used to work at majors have left and then effectively sold their services back to the majors, yeah. <coughs> which the majors then effectively sell out to other clients. Because I know there's independent companies that are doing it as well, small companies. Yes, they are. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of not a bad idea. That's just an outsourced services. God, I hate myself for learning all this business speak. Isn't it dangerous to rely on people that are expert in, you know, on a sinking market? Because after all, they are experts, but some that is old, they maybe don't imagine your business model at all. I don't know. Or is it the same old you know, methods to advertise, to, you know, don't you think it, I know what you're saying. Don't you think it depends on what kind of artist you want to be? Yeah. If you want to Absolutely. be Rihanna, Absolutely. you need that stuff. But that brings up a whole other question about why people, what, what kind of artists are people interested in? The function of pop music in society is changing. It's no longer, for my generation certainly, it was our social identifier. You identified who you were by what music you liked. It was our kind of social glue. But I look around me now, you know, I teach at the Institute in Kilburn, and I get students from 17 to 50. And they no longer use music in that way. It's not their social identifier. There are so many other things on the cultural landscape that are important to them that music's just another item in the cultural landscape. The major label idea, or the star system idea, of selling you the concept that this person is an aspirational figure is falling apart. We've all seen too many documentaries on the making of, the marketing of. The labels would like us to believe that Bruce Springsteen can be found riding his motorcycle through the streets of New Jersey at 3 o'clock in the morning. Rubbish! He's at home, bed on his orthopedic mattress by 10 o'clock. It's nonsense. And we know it now, right? We don't believe it anymore, do we? So what are they selling us? Oh, he's another old man that plays the guitar. Great. Which brings another question, which should also lie at the heart of your considerations of what to do in terms of designing and building your business model. And I'm going to introduce a very useful device, which the first time I saw it made me scream with horror and rage because I had to learn some jargon. This is called the Business Model Canvas, and you could download it from www.businessmodelgeneration.com. And at first sight, I knew I was going to fall over that. I knew it was going to happen. Tommy and I have been trying to tread these down for the past half hour. At least I didn't go completely far on my face. Business model generation. At first glance, you go, what the hell is this? I'm going to use a simplified version of it, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is this thing in the middle that's called value propositions. What the hell's a value proposition? You are. Your music is your value proposition. Basically, what it means is what have you got to sell? What is it that you have or do that is of value to other people who don't have or do it? Let's 
find out. What's your value proposition? Anybody care to tell, tell us what their value proposition is? Records. Records, okay. Containing your music or mm -hmm. other people's? Okay. Original. Merchandise. Merchandise. Okay. Video. A good musical experience. Sorry? A good enjoyable musical experience. A good enjoyable music musical experience, okay. Originality. Originality, that's an interesting one. And I'm glad you said it. A lot of people say, oh, it's impossible to be original anymore. I think it's rubbish. If what you do is an honest reflection of who you are, you're original. Nobody else is like you. If it's honestly who you are, you're original. But what is going to make somebody come and consume your music? And I'm choosing my words really carefully. I didn't say buy. I said, what is going to make somebody come and consume your music? Because we need to define that as well. It's what you're giving to the other person. Yeah, but what do you give to the other person? How many musicians have we got in the room? Right. Why, why, why is yours different to theirs? Why should I come to see you out of the thicket? If I can use the expression, no offence. The thicket, the, the woods, the forest of musicians. Why you? Well, it's well, his music resonates with you. And, it's, and you're his audience. Yeah, but why should I go and see him in the first place? But how do I find out about him? It's lifestyle, aspiration. Uh, lifestyle. I, like, I want to be like that. Okay. I'm not sure about that anymore. I'm not sure about that. But we've got a variety of answers. The first thing you've got to figure out is what is your value proposition? What have I got that's going to make people go, yeah, I'll go and see him, her, it, them, or whatever configuration you work in? At some point is when other people start following you and people see that there is a stream of people following you, they say, oh, it must be good. It kind of believes itself, fun. that's true. But I think the question is, how do you stop? How do you get the ball rolling? Well, hopefully you could, hopefully somebody sees you and tells somebody else word of mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so you've just got to be out there doing it, right? If you're good, stuff will happen. We had a student on our songwriting course, uh, I was telling Rosie earlier, who was out doing yet another bloody acoustic open mic night for no money to a room full of people who were talking over her. And she stood up, she did her thing. And in the audience were Matt Bellamy from Muse and his manager. The following Saturday, she was supporting Muse at the Stade de France in Paris. Wow. Right. <laughs> because she was out there just doing it. So your value proposition, you've got to think about what it is. I'm going to simplify this, and I'll draw a simplified version in a minute. That's you. Over here, you've got things and people and resources that you need in order to do what you do. Key partners, key activities, key resources and cost structure. What does it cost me to do what I do? What resources do I need to do what I do? What are the key activities that make up my value proposition? And what are the, who are the key partners without whom I cannot do this? And then over here, you've got your customer facing side. Who are my customers? How do I reach them? Interestingly, how do they reach me as well? That's a two-way channel. My customer relationships, that's a two-way channel. Revenue streams. What have I got coming back in to balance what's going out there. And there's two great examples that work really well. This is not my original thought, this comes from the book that this canvas is taken from, that are really good examples of how this works. There are also good examples of old and new business models, BT and Skype. Let's look at them, make notes if you want. BT, BT's value proposition is that you can pick up a device in your home that lets you talk to somebody an incredibly long way away or even reasonably short way, to, way away without you having to go there. Yes? Yes. Right. It's called a phone. <laughs> <laughs> what are their costs? BT build and maintain the physical structures over which these calls are made. Telegraph poles, wires, exchanges, undersea cables, satellites. That's not cheap, is it?
their customers are us. From us, they have to extract enough revenue to exceed that. Yes? We won't bother about all the rest of them. You can figure that out for yourself. For the moment, that's enough to understand. Because their costs are so high, they have to extract enough revenue. Bear in mind the internet also largely is transmitted over BT's physical structure, so they charge everybody for using the internet. Okay, so we've got the idea of BT's business model. It's high cost. Skype. Wipe it clean, start again. What does Skype do? What's their value proposition? No, radically different. You can talk to anybody anywhere in the world for free if they have an internet connection, or both of you have an internet connection and a computer. What are their costs? <coughs> Nothing. <coughs> Nothing. Okay, a few software developers to write the to write the software and keep tweaking it and moving things around so you can't find the thing that was in the menu up there last week. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But they don't have to put telegraph poles and wires and undersea cables up, do they? So there's a peer-to-peer -peer system as well, so it's not, yeah, it's not massive like servers. it all goes through one Okay, but it's nowhere near BT's infrastructure. Oh, BT yeah. have got massive servers. So their costs are much less. Here's the clever thing, though. Who pays the costs? You pay for your internet connection, right? Nobody else. Skype don't have to pay for the internet connection. They don't have to rent the airtime on BT's wires. You pay for it. Brilliant! Not only have I got my customers to buy my service, I've got them to pay for the delivery costs, the manufacturing costs, the lot. Genius. Two radically different business models. <coughs> that leads us into the first business model I want to talk about, which is known as the freemium model. Because the way that Skype work is that you can have a free Skype account or you can have a premium Skype account. A premium Skype account, you can pay for calls to landlines. Very, very low rates, but you can pay for calls to landlines <coughs> and mobiles. They figure I only need 1% of my customer base to transfer to my premium program to finance the other 99%. So out of every million customers I have, if only one of them... No, I've got the fears on. <laughs> you get the idea. 1%. Out of every 100 customers I've got, if one of them converts... To, <laughs> I told you I wasn't the business <laughs> If one of them converts... To the paid model, bingo. If two of them convert, I'm in profit. Simple. That's the freemium model. Anybody think of a musician or band who have operated this? Radiohead. Radiohead. Nine Inch Nails. Nine Inch Nails. There are other people. Nine Inch Nails. Trent Reznor does really interesting things. Do you want to hear about? Do you, do you know about I Trent Reznor? Radiohead do it, well they kind of started the mad rush by releasing an album, much to the incredible annoyance of their record company, T. He. They released an album on the internet for free, download it, help yourself, pay if you like, yeah, well, yeah, pay what you want, you can have it for nothing or you can pay what you want, okay. Some people took it for nothing, some people paid a quid, some people paid ten quid, you're looking aghast and horrified. For a traditional music business person, this is madness. They sold more physical copies of that record because of the way they did it, because they offered a premium version. You could buy a deluxe version of the CD that had extra tracks and additional stuff. There are people doing really, really interesting things with this. There are artists who say, okay, help yourself to my music store on my website, help yourself. Doesn't cost you anything. Go ahead. 
for $50, I'll send, send you a signed CD. For $100, you can come and meet me for a drink and take away a signed CD. For $1,000, I'll take you out to dinner. I'll tell you scurrilous tale. There's one drummer who sells his records on the basis that He'll take you out to dinner and tell you scurrilous tales from the dressing room from his career. <laughs> I'm thinking of it myself. I know a few scurrilous tales from the dressing room, but he knew it. For $5,000, I will make you a copy of the CD that has a song on it written for you. You could sell one CD for $5,000. Go back to our equation from the major label deal. Full. That's the freemium model. Is there someone that said for 10, 10 grand I'll take a trip with you? <laughs> that would be interesting. No, but I can believe it. You can well believe it. Trent Reznor, the, the guy from Nine Inch Nails. So, does everybody know about him? Yeah. <laughs> okay, for those of you that don't, Trent, Trent Reznor, R E Z N O R. What he started doing was again giving his music away, and he did really clever, clever things. There's a great TED talk on it, go and look, oh no, it's a medium talk, isn't it? It's a guy medium talking about Trent Reznor's thing. One of the things he did was he scattered USB sticks around the floor of a gig. And people would go, oh, it's a USB memory stick, all like that. <laughs> One has to kind of question the wisdom of picking up a USB stick off the floor of a toilet and putting it in your computer. There are many kinds of virus. <laughs> but enough people went, oh, I love that. Put it in your computer. Bang! Great little music video came up. And then a link that led them to his website. He did other things. There was a thing he did where he put out stuff he put out stuff that had clues in it, and if you put the clues together, it told you, was it, a, there was a, a special gig you did, there was like a free... Well, he even released the tracks of the songs to let people release them. Uh, that's another thing. We release the stems, let people be mixing. Why not? So that's the freemium model. Any comments on this? Yeah. Did Trent Reznor also do a thing where he had an album for free that people would come on, they just had it with their email address, yeah. in, and then sent them... Yeah, you know, actually, if you grab this now, there'll be free, couple free tracks or something else like an additional. Email addresses are the new currency. You used to use pound and coins and stuff. Email addresses are the new currency, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this only makes sense for uh, well-known artists. Great point. You're absolutely right, and that's the first objection that people raise to the Trent Reznor story. Is yeah, and to the Radiohead story is great. But they already had a following. I don't. What am I going to do? How am I going to start this? Start with one. Build. Start with one and build. Any other ideas? Anything you think you could do as a freemium model? What? The key question is this. Why is somebody going to listen to my music? You can do a public start. For example, I, came up with, I, I was thinking about doing this and I'll do it eventually. I was thinking about going in one of the rooms to reclaim illegally and serve my band and do a gig over there. Loads of people are coming over and they will see. It's going to be like a hashtag for Twitter, that's the only clue, and then they go and find out what people say. I came up with a great idea for a public stunt, which will get me arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do it, and I'm talking to a couple of, I'm talking to a couple of guys who, who, who've been graffiti artists for some time. <laughs> What I want to do is I want to walk into a bank wearing a camouflage jacket and a balaclava with an acoustic guitar and sing a verse of money by Pink Floyd. Before the, before the steel bolts come down. I'll get arrested for sure. This graffiti guy said that nowadays the police are using anti-terrorist legislation to basically try and stop them doing their thing. But that would be a great public stunt. That would go viral, wouldn't it? And I'd be languish what, languishing in Brixton Jail. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Get done on the anti-terrorists, they don't have to tell anyone where you are, right? They just keep you there. It's not so fun.
Oh, come on, I want to do it. If you believe with the comments, we'll come again. We'll come again. We'll come again. You can be short in the process. That's the only <laughs> problem. That's kind of a dead artist is the most successful one. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other angles on, on, on that, freemium? Any other ideas on freemium? Yeah. You could sell, uh, your, well, you could publish your music and uh, promote it uh, while selling more of your craft. And what I mean by that is you might have you might have like guitar oriented music, so you're like, okay, this is my CD, and if you make this donation, I'll like do a Skype session with you where I show you the riffs of great, great the idea, great idea. Now, something that some people do is they release a deluxe version that has video of you playing the guitar parts, and they end up in YouTube the next day. <laughs> great thing to do, yeah, but then you go, okay, well, that's publicity, it's isn't good. it? There's so many ways of doing this, and what I find interesting is that because I have probably one and a one and one and a half feet in the old school music business, I carry a lot of baggage from that. And no matter how hard I drag that foot out, I I can lean into the the other side, but I'm not as free in my thinking as people who are 20 years old who don't have a foot in the music business. And there are things starting to happen that are really interesting. Um, I'll come to you in a minute. There's one band I know of who did a deal with a local restaurant and said, OK, you've got a big room here. Right, we'll do a gig out in the back room after dinner. We'll be the waiters during dinner. <laughs> so our fans can come and see us and we'll talk to them as we're spilling the soup in there. That. <laughs> and afterwards we'll do a gig. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering what people think about whether they should even uh, keep separation between the art side of things and, and selling their time or efforts, uh, you know, in the, more, in the kind of teaching capacity or other areas or that. Because at the moment I have a little uh, online business related to music teaching music, but I keep that completely separate from, from my creative side. Why? Because um, when I've spoken to other people that are in that sphere, there's a guy called Justin Sandico. I was just Sandico. about to mention him. He, <laughs> he didn't find it went over too well, so... He eventually focused on his teaching really, really quite heavily because that's what was making him money. Can I, can I yeah. Yes, of course. To be fair, I don't have played guitar from Justin, like, he's amazing. But, to me, him promoting the album on the website, it wasn't, it came across cheesy. Really? Yeah, cheesy. Okay. So, as a consumer, I was never really interested. But why is that? Because if you go back to Mozart, teaching was a vital part of his life. I think, I think, I'm not criticising your view, I'm, I'm interested in what you think. I think more so because of the presentation of it, so I think it could have been, been done a lot better if he would have presented it more as an art form, but it was, it was, it's more like, I'm a teacher, I'm right. my work. Right, you know? I get your point, I agree, actually, I yeah, know. I think that's a good point, I agree. So if it had been professional, would it look all made? If it had been professional, then maybe... No, I mean, the whole campaign about... He had a whole campaign where it was um, crowdfunded, yeah. and but it's just that the presentation of the album in his website it was just like a promotion. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't seem like it was an art experience. It just seemed like I'm a guitar teacher and he wants to buy my album. Yeah. So you're saying it, you're saying it didn't look good. But what I'm interested in, I, I don't know about this guy. I don't know the product. Was the product good? And was just a packaging shit. I, I was I didn't listen. Not good. <laughs> he didn't even yeah. get as far as listening. <laughs> That's a really interesting <laughs> comment. That's really interesting and worrying. But what you're saying, if I'm not misunderstanding you, is that had he presented his music as a musician separately to his work as a teacher, you would not have been put off by it. Yeah. Right. So he has to figure out how to do that. Yeah. I'm just saying, if, if you're teaching and then you present your work forward. Um, I think there's a potential that if somebody's not really feeling your music, 
they might not hire you as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's what I wanted to get so I wanted to market research of my uh, subscribers. Most of them are 35 to 65, based in southwest of the US. They're like, basically blue skies. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. I love that kind of music. But my music is completely different from that. And that's why that's another reason why I've always kept the two separate. I'm not saying, I mean, that's why I'm putting it out there. Does anyone have any ideas about how to, to is, should I have a crossover? Should I not? How about a teacher pseudonym? <laughs> what, what if you, you promoted your teaching as an art, like your artwork? Because Justin is very much, you go on his site, it's like, I'm a guitar teacher. If you want to pay, you can pay. That whole radio, if you want to pay, if you don't, you don't. But if he presented his, his teaching as an art form as well, now I'm, I don't know the, the, um, how you do that, but it's, I think it's about presentation, I think it's how you. That's a really interesting idea. The gentleman at the back there. I think there's something about, you know, there is no one answer. There's no, it's not like we can say, this is the way to do it, just go out and do it. Mm. Um, know, but that's but, like, but that's for you, I think what you're, given, given, the, given the information that you've got, then clearly they need to be separate, they need to be separate things because the audience you've got for one thing is not the audience for the other. How about, so, sorry, you, know, you need to do some work on building the audience for your, for the stuff you love. How about if he narrowed his guitar teaching down to the blues and only sold yeah. blues music? Well, how would you feel about doing that? Okay, he's he's, he's not looking it. happy, is he? <laughs> <laughs> yes, your, your question. Well, another thing that you consider, and this is for this as well, that if you if you are good at, as a guitar teacher, I'll just use that as, a, as an example, if you're a good guitar teacher and you know and you believe in your music and your music's good, then that kind of crossover, although you might have guitar students that don't uh, they don't want to get your music and vice versa that if you're good at both things and you're kind of building a brand for yourself in a way a name so you might have a guitar student who thinks i don't want to buy your album but i know someone who really likes this music i'm then going to say hey come check out this guy's so he's my teacher and that's kind of word of mouth it then spreads how many of us ever thought when we picked up a guitar that we would ever use the sentence building a brand <laughs> <laughs> yes i think uh, i think people are looking for something innovative and something different that's yes. what catches their attention. That's why all the composers throughout well, history, like Mozart, uh, are well became famous and even so Yeah, we famous. never heard about the crap ones, did we? <laughs> and there were loads of them. Yeah. yeah. But also I think like for example I'm a classical musician. Um, I play for a large London orchestra, but I also have my own string quartet. Last month uh, we played a concert in Bermondsey where I did. And my idea is to approach classical music, to introduce classical music to the young generation. Right. So they're not that familiar with it. Probably the association people have with classical music is something boring for retired people, but you can't even <laughs> open and do it when you're at the concert. And the way we did it is um, we actually, when we were rehearsing, the doors of the church were open. A lot of people came in to. That's a great were idea. We talked to them about the day of the concert. Um, then in the break, we were offering wine, we were talking to people. You don't normally get to talk yeah. to Offering people. wine might have been really <laughs> <laughs> That's a really interesting thing. Can I relate that to something that I think is quite interesting about music? You talked about the idea of people not being allowed to talk during a concert. And I think in a concert environment, that's quite important. And we all know that when you're in the presence of fantastic performers, they cast a spell, right? And there's a pact between audience and performer where if you shut up and if you let me, I can weave my spell and I can take you places of great wonder and beauty and sadness and joy and all the stuff. But if you break the spell, I have to start all over again. That's the pact between artist and performer. And we live in a society where people talk over art, which annoys the hell out of me. Having said that, there is another arena in music that is really interesting. I was doing some research for writing a um, university course, a place that I teach, and I found the suggestion that it is only in the last 500 years or so that there has been a separation of performer and audience. And that's a really interesting idea, because if we go back to what music is, Actually, music is a great communal activity. There is also a separation that has grown up 
in the modern music industry whereby only the experts are allowed to engage in the creation of music and even within the expert community if you're not as good as me I'm not going to play with you.